At last I was exasperated into saying, why don't you put the matter at rest by talking to Herman? And I added sneeringly, you didn't expect me, perhaps, to speak for you. To this he said, very loud for him, would you? And for the first time he lifted his head to look at me with wonder and incredulity. He lifted his head so sharply that there could be no mistake. I had touched a spring. I saw the whole extent of my opportunity and could hardly believe in it. Why? Speak to? Well, of course, I proceeded very slowly, watching him with great attention, for, on my word, I feared a joke. Not perhaps to the young lady herself, I can't speak German, you know, but... He interrupted me with the earnest assurance that Hermann had the highest opinion of me, and at once I felt the need for the greatest possible diplomacy at this juncture. So I demurred just enough to draw him on. Fox sat up, but except for a very noticeable enlargement of the pupils, till the irises of his eyes were reduced to two narrow yellow rings, his face, I should judge, was incapable of expressing excitement. Oh yes, Hermann did have the greatest. Take up your cards. Here's Schomburg peeping at us through the blind, I said. We went through the motions of what might have been a game of Ecarte. Presently, the intolerable scandalmonger withdrew, probably to inform the people in the billiard room that we two were gambling on the veranda like mad. We were not gambling, but it was a game, a game in which I felt I held the winning cards. The stake, roughly speaking, was the success of the voyage. For me, and he, I apprehended, had nothing to lose. Our intimacy matured rapidly, and before many words had been exchanged, I perceived that the excellent Hermann had been making use of me. That simple and astute Teuton had been, it seems, holding me up to Falk in the light of a rival. I was young enough to be shocked at so much duplicity, did he tell you that in so many words, I asked with indignation? Hermann had not. He had given hints only, and of course it had not taken very much to alarm Falk. But instead of declaring himself, he had taken steps to remove the family from under my influence. He was perfectly straightforward about it, as straightforward as a tile falling on your head. There was no duplicity in that man, and I congratulated him on the perfection of his arrangements, even to the bribing of the wretched Johnson against me. He had a genuine movement of protest, never bribed. He knew the man wouldn't work as long as he had a few cents in his pocket to get drunk on, and naturally, he said, naturally. He let him have a dollar or two. He was himself a sailor, he said, and anticipated the view another sailor like myself would have bound to take. On the other hand, he was sure that I should have to come to grief. He hadn't been knocking about for the last seven years up and down that river for nothing. It would have been no disgrace to me, but he asserted confidently I would have had my ship very awkwardly ashore at a spot two miles below the Great Pagoda. And with all that, he had no ill will. That was evident. This was a crisis in which his only object had been to gain time, I fancy. And presently he mentioned that he had written for some jewelry, real good jewelry, had written to Hong Kong for it. It would arrive in a day or two. Well then, I said cheerily, everything is all right. All you've got to do is present it to the lady together with your heart and live happily ever after. Upon the whole, he seemed to accept that view as fair as the girl was concerned, but his eyelids drooped. There was still something in the way. For one thing, Hermann disliked him so much. As to me, on the contrary, it seemed as though he could not praise me enough. Mrs. Hermann, too. He didn't know why they disliked him, so it made everything most difficult. I listened impassive, feeling more and more diplomatic. 
His speech was not transparently clear. He was one of those men who seemed to live, feel, suffer in a sort of mental twilight. But as to being fascinated by the girl and possessed by the desire of home life with her, it was as clear as daylight. So much as being at stake, he was afraid of putting it to the hazard of declaration. Besides, there was something else, and with Hermann being so set against him. I see, I said thoughtfully. Well, my heart beat fast with the excitement of my diplomacy. I don't mind sounding Hermann. Uh, in fact, uh, to show you how mistaken you were, I am ready to do all I can for you in that way. A light sigh escaped him. He drew his hands down his face, and it emerged bony, unchanged of expression as if all the tissues had been ossified. All the passion was in those big brown hands. He was satisfied. Then there was that other matter. If there were anybody on earth, it was I who could persuade Hermann to take a reasonable view. I had a knowledge of the world and lots of experience. Hermann admitted this himself. And then I was a sailor, too. Fuck thought that a sailor would be able to understand certain things best. He talked as if the Hermans had been living all their life in a rural hamlet, and I alone had been capable, with my practice in life, of a large and indulgent view of certain occurrences. That was what my diplomacy was leading me to. I began suddenly to dislike it. I say, Falk, I asked quite brusquely. You haven't already a wife put away somewhere. The pain and disgust of his denial were very striking. Couldn't I understand that he was as respectable as any white man hereabouts, earning his living honestly? He was suffering from my suspicion, and the low undertone of his voice made his protestations sound very pathetic. For a moment he shamed me. But my diplomacy notwithstanding, I seemed to develop a conscience as if, in very truth, it were in my power to decide the success of this matrimonial enterprise. By pretending hard enough to come to believe anything, anything to our advantage, and I had been pretending very hard because I meant yet to be towed safely down the river, but through conscience or stupidity, I couldn't help alluding to the Van Lo affair. You acted rather badly there, didn't you? Was what I ventured actually to say. For the logic of our conduct is always at the mercy of obscure and unforeseen impulses. His dilated pupils swerved from my face, glancing at the window with a sort of scared fury. We heard behind the blinds the continuous and sudden clicking of ivory, a jovial murmur of many voices, and Schomburg's deep manly laugh. That confounded old woman of a hotel keeper then would never let it rest, Falk explained. Well, yes, it happened two years ago. When it came to the point he owned he couldn't make up his mind to trust Fred Vanlo, no sailor, a bit of a fool, too. He could not trust him but to stop his row. He had lent him enough money to pay all his debts before he left. I was greatly surprised to hear this. Then Falk could not be such a miser after all. So much the better for the girl. For a time, he sat silent. Then he picked up a card, and while looking at it, he said, You need not think of anything bad. It was an accident. I have been unfortunate once. Then in heaven's name, say nothing about it. As soon as those words were out of my mouth, I fancied I had said something immoral. He shook his head negatively. It had to be told. He considered it proper that the relations of the lady should know. No doubt, I thought to myself, had Miss Vanlo not been thirty and damaged by the climate, he would have found it possible to entrust Fred Vanlo with this confidence. And then the figure of Hermann's niece appeared before my eyes, with the wealth of her opulent form, her rich youth, her lavish strength, with that powerful and immaculate vitality, her girlish form must have shouted aloud of life to that man, whereas Miss Vanlo could only sing sentimental songs 
to the strumming of a piano. And that Hermann hates me, I know it, he cried in his undertone with a certain recrucidence of anxiety. I must tell them it is proper that they should know. You would say so yourself. He then murmured an utterly mysterious allusion to the necessity for peculiar domestic arrangements. Though my curiosity was excited, I did not want to hear any of his confidences. I feared he might give me a piece of information that would make my assumed role of matchmaker odious, however unreal it was. I was aware that he could have the girl for the asking, and keeping down a desire to laugh in his face, I expressed a confident belief in my ability to argue away Hermann's dislike for him. I am sure I can make it all right, I said. He looked very pleased. And when we rose, not a word had been said about the towage. Not a word. The game was won, and the honor was safe. Oh, bless the white cotton umbrella. We shook hands, and I was holding myself with difficulty from breaking into a step dance of joy when he came back, striding all the length of the veranda, and said, doubtfully, I say, Captain, I have your word. You, you won't turn round. Heavens, the fright he gave me. Behind his tone of doubt there was something desperate and menacing. The infatuated ass, but I was equal to the situation. My dear Falk, I said, beginning to lie with a glibness and effrontery that amazed me even at the time. Confidence for confidence. He had made no confidences. I will tell you that I am already engaged in, in, to an extremely charming girl at home, and so you understand. He caught my hand and wrung it in a crushing grip. Pardon me, I feel it every day more difficult to live alone. On rice and fish, I interrupted smartly, giggling with the sheer nervousness of a danger escaped. He dropped my hand as if it had become suddenly red hot. A moment of profound silence ensued, as though something extraordinary had happened. I promise you to obtain Hermann's consent, I faltered at last, and it seemed to me that he could not help seeing through that humbug promise. If there is anything else to get over, I shall endeavor to stand by you, I conceded further, feeling somehow defeated and overborne, but you must do your best yourself. I have been unfortunate once, he muttered unemotionally, and turning his back on me went away thumping slowly the plank floor as if his feet had been shod with iron. Next morning, however, he was lively enough as man-boat, a combination of splashing and shouting of the insolent commotion below with the steady, overbearing glare of the silent headpiece above. He turned us out most unnecessarily at an ungodly hour, but it was nearly eleven in the morning before he brought me up a cable's length from Hermann's ship, and he did it very badly, too, in a hurry and neatly contriving to miss altogether the patch of good holding ground, because, forsooth, he had caught sight of Hermann's niece on the poop, and so did I, and probably as soon as he had seen her himself, I saw the modest, sleek glory of the tawny head and the full gray shape of the girlish print frock she filled so perfectly, so satisfactorily, with the seduction of unfaltering curves, a very nymph Diana the Huntress. And Diana the ship sat, high-walled and as solid as an institution, on the smooth level of the water, the most uninspiring and respectable craft upon the seas useful and ugly, devoted to the support of domestic virtues, like any grocer's shop on shore. At once Fox steamed away, there was some work for him to do. He would return in the evening. He ranged close by us, passing out dead slow without a hail, the beat of the paddle wheels reverberating amongst the stony islets, as if from the ruined walls of a vast arena, filled with the anchorage confusedly, with the clapping sounds of a mighty and leisurely applause. Abreast of Hermann's ship, he stopped the engines, and a profound silence reigned over the rocks. The shore and the sea, for the time it took him to raise his hat aloft before the nymph of the gray print frock, 
I had snatched up my binoculars, and I can answer for it. She didn't stir a limb, standing by the rail, shapely and erect, with one of her hands grasping a rope at the height of her head, all the way of the tug carried slowly past her the lingering and profound homage of the man. There was for me an enormous significance in the scene, the sense of having witnessed a solemn declaration. The die was cast. After such a manifestation, he couldn't back out, and I reflected that it was nothing whatever to me now. With a rush of black smoke belching suddenly out of the funnel, a mad swirl of paddle wheels provoking a burst of weird and precipitated clapping, the tug shot out of the desolate arena. The rocky islets lay on the sea like the heaps of a cyclopean ruin on a plain. The centipedes and scorpions lurked under the stones. There was not a single blade of grass in sight anywhere. Not a single lizard sunning himself on a boulder by the shore. When I looked again at Hermann's ship, the girl had disappeared. I could not detect the smallest dot of a bird on the immense sky, and the flatness of the land continued the flatness of the sea to the naked line of the horizon. This is the setting now, inseparably connected with my knowledge of Falk's misfortune. My diplomacy had brought me there, and now I had only to wait the time for taking up the role of an ambassador. My diplomacy was a success, my ship was safe, old Gambriel would probably live. A feeble sound of a tapping hammer came intermittently from the Diana. During the afternoon I looked at times at the old homely ship, the faithful nurse of Hermann's progeny, or yawned towards the distant temple of Buddha, like a lonely hillock on the plain, where shaven priests cherish the thoughts of that annihilation which is worthy reward of us all. Unfortunate. He had been unfortunate once. Well, that was not so bad as life goes, and what the devil could be the nature of that misfortune. I remembered that I had known a man before who had declared himself to have fallen, years ago, a victim of misfortune, but this misfortune, whose effects appeared permanent, he looked desperately hard up, when considered dispassionately, seemed undistinguishable from a breach of trust. Could it be something of that nature? Apart, however, from the utter improbability that he would offer to take off it even to his future uncle-in-law, I had a strange feeling that Fox physique unfitted him for that sort of delinquency. As the person of Hermann's niece exhaled the profound physical charm of feminine form, so her adorer's big frame embodied to my senses the hard, straight masculinity that would conceivably kill but would not condescend to cheat. The thing was obvious. Now, I might just as well have suspected the girl of a curvature of the spine, and I perceived that the sun was about to set. The smoke of fox tug hove in sight, far away at the mouth of the river, it was time for me to assume the character of an ambassador, and the negotiation would not be difficult except in the matter of keeping my countenance. It was all too extravagantly nonsensical, and I conceived that it would be best to compose myself a grave demeanor. I practiced this in my boat as I went along, but the bashfulness that came secretly upon me the moment I stepped on the deck of the Diana is inexplicable. As soon as we had exchanged greetings, Hermann asked me eagerly if I knew whether Falk had found his white parasol. He is going to bring it to you himself directly, I said with great solemnity. Meantime, I am charged with an important message for which he begs your favorable consideration. He is in love with your niece. Ach, so? He hissed with an animosity that made my assumed gravity change into the most genuine concern. What meant this tone? And I hurried on. He wishes, with your consent, of course, to ask her to marry him at once, before you leave here, that is. I would speak to the consul. Herman sat down and smoked violently. Five minutes passed in that furious meditation, and then, taking my long pipe 
out of his mouth, he burst into a hot diatribe against Falk, against his cupidity, his stupidity, a fellow that can hardly be got to say yes or no to the simplest question, against his outrageous treatment of the shipping in port because he saw they were at his mercy, and against his manner of walking, which to his, Hermann's, mind showed a conceit positively unbearable. The damage to the old Diana was not forgotten, of course, and there was nothing of any nature said or done by Falk, even to the last offer of refreshment in the hotel, that did not seem to have the cause of offense, had the cheek to drag him, Hermann, into that coffee room, as though a drink from him could make up for $47.50 of damage and the cost of wood alone, not counting two days' work for the carpenter. Of course, he would not stand in the girl's way. He was going home to Germany. There were plenty of poor girls walking about in Germany. He's very much in love, was all I found to say. Yes, he cried, and it is time, too, after making himself and me talked about ashore the last voyage I was here, and then now again coming on board every evening, unsettling the girl's mind and saying nothing. What sort of conduct is that? The seven thousand dollars the fellow was always talking about did not, in my opinion, justify such behavior. Moreover, nobody had seen them. He, Hermann, seriously doubted if there were seven thousand cents in the tug, no doubt, was mortgaged to the top of the funnel to the firm of Seegers. But let that pass. He wouldn't stand in the girl's way. Her head was so turned that she had become no good to them of late, quite unable even to put the children to bed without her aunt. It was bad for the children. They got unruly, and yesterday he actually had to give Gustav a thrashing. For that, too, Falk was made responsible, apparently, and looking at my Hermann's heavy, puffy, good-natured face, I knew he would not exert himself till greatly exasperated, and therefore would thrash very hard, and being fat would resent the necessity. How Falk had managed to turn the girl's head was more difficult to understand. I supposed Hermann would know, and then hadn't there been Miss Vanlow? It could not be his silvery tongue or the subtle seduction of his manner. He had no more of what is called manner than an animal, which, however, on the other hand, is never and can never be called vulgar. Therefore, it must have been his bodily appearance, exhibiting a virility of nature as exaggerated as his beard and resembling a sort of constant ruthlessness. It was seen in the very manner he lolled in the chair. He meant no offense, but his intercourse was characterized by that sort of frank disregard of susceptibilities. A man of seven foot six, living in a world of dwarfs, would naturally assume, without in the least wishing to be unkind. But amongst men of his own stature, or nearly, this frank use of his advantages in such matters, as the awful towage bills, for instance, caused much impotent gnashing of teeth. When attentively considered, it seemed appalling at times. He was a strange beast, but maybe women like that. Seen in that light, he was well worth taming, and I suppose every woman at the butt of her heart considers herself as a tamer of strange beasts. But Hermann arose with precipitation to carry the news to his wife. I had barely the time, as he made for the cabin door, to grab him by the seat of his inexpressibles. I begged him to wait till Falk and Person had spoken with him. There remained some small matter to talk over, as I understood. He sat down again at once, full of suspicion. What matter? he said surly. I have enough of his it's nonsense. There's no matter at all. He says he knows very well. The girl has nothing in the world. She came to us in one thin dress when my m brother died, and I have a growing family. It can't be anything of that kind, I opined. He's desperately enamored of your niece. I don't know why he did not say so before. Upon my word, I believe it is because 
he was afraid to lose, perhaps, the felicity of sitting near her on your quarter deck. I intimated my conviction that his love was so great as to be, in a sense, cowardly. The effects of a great passion are unaccountable. It has been known to make a man timid, but Hermann looked at me as if I had foolishly raved, and the twilight was dying out rapidly. You don't believe in passion, do you, Hermann? I said cheerily. The passion of fear will make a cornered rat courageous. Fox in a corner. He will take her off your hands in one thin frock just as she came to you. And after ten years' service it is in a bad bargain, I added. Far from taking offense, he resumed his air of civic virtue. A sudden night came upon him while he stared placidly along the deck, bringing into contact with his thick lips and taking away, again after a jet of smoke, the curved mouthpiece fitted to the stem of his pipe. The night came upon him and buried in haste his whiskers, his globular eyes, his puffy pale face, his fat knees, and the vast flat slippers on his fatherly feet. Only his short arms and respectable white shirt sleeves remained very visible, propped up like the flippers of a seal reposing on the strand. Falk wouldn't settle anything about repairs. Told me to find out first how much wood I should require, and he would see, he remarked. And after he spat peacefully in the dusk, we heard over the water the beat of the tug's floats. There is, on a calm night, nothing more suggestive of fierce and headlong haste than the rapid sound made by the paddle wheels of a boat threshing her way through a quiet sea, and the approach of Falk towards his fate seemed to be urged by an impatient and passionate desire. The engines must have been driven to the very utmost of their revolutions. We heard them slow down at last, and vaguely the white hull of the tug appeared moving against the black eyelets, whilst the slow and rhythmical clapping of so a thousand hands rose on all sides. It ceased all at once, just before Falk brought her up. A single brusque splash was followed by the long-drawn rumbling of iron links running through the hawse pipe. Then a solemn silence fell upon the roadstead. He will soon be here, I murmured, and after that we waited for him without a word. Meantime, raising my eyes, I beheld the glitter of a lofty sky above the Diana's mastheads. The multitude of stars gathered into clusters, in rows, in lines, in masses, in groups, shone all together unanimously, and the few isolated ones, blazing by themselves in the midst of dark patches, seemed to be of a superior kind of an inextinguishable nature. But long striding footsteps were heard, hastening along the deck. The high bulwarks of the Diana made a deeper darkness. We rose from our chairs quickly, and Falk appeared before us, all in white, stood still. Nobody spoke at first, as though we had been covered with confusion. His arrival was fiery, but his white bulk of indefinite shape and without features made him loom up like a man of snow. The captain here has been telling me, Hermann began in a homely and amicable voice, and Falk had a low, nervous laugh. His cool, negligent undertone had no inflections, but the strength of a powerful emotion made him ramble in his speech. He had always desired a home. It was difficult to live alone, though he was not answerable. He was domestic. There had been difficulties, but since he had seen Hermann's niece, he found it had become at last impossible to live by himself. I mean impossible, he repeated with no sort of emphasis, and only with the slightest of pauses. But with the word fell into my mind the force of a new idea. I have not said anything to her yet, Hermann observed quietly, and Falk dismissed this by a, that's all right, certainly very proper. There was a necessity for perfect frankness, in marrying especially. Hermann seemed attentive, but he seized the first opportunity to ask us into the cabin, 
And by and by, Falk, he said innocently as we passed, the timber came to no less than forty-seven dollars and fifty cents. Falk, uncovering his head, lingered in the passage. Some other time, he said, and Hermann nudged me angrily. I don't know why. The girl alone in the cabin sat sewing at some distance from the table. Falk stopped short in the doorway, without a word, without a sign, without the slightest inclination of his bony head. By the silent intensity of his look alone, he seemed to lay his Herculean frame at her feet. Her hands sank slowly on her lap, and raising her clear eyes, she let her soft, beaming glance enfold him from head to foot, like slow and pale caress. He was very hot when he sat down. She, with bowed head, went on with her sewing. Her neck was very white under the light of the lamp, but Falk, hiding his face in the palms of his hands, shuddered faintly. He drew them down, even to his beard, and his uncovered eyes astonished me by their intense and irrational expression as though he had just swallowed a heavy gulp of alcohol. It passed away while he was binding us to secrecy. Not that he cared, but he did not like to be spoken about. And I looked at the girl's marvelous, at oh, her wonderful, at her regal hair, plaited tight into that one astonishing and maidenly tress. Whenever she moved her well-shaped head, it would stir stiffly to and fro on her back. The thin cotton sleeve fitted the irreproachable roundness of her arm like a skin, and her very dress, stretched on her bust, seemed to palpitate like a living tissue with the strength of vitality animating her body. How good her complexion was! The outline of her soft cheek and the small convoluted couch of her rosy ear. To pull her needle, she kept the little finger apart from the others, it seemed a waste of power to see her sewing, eternally sewing, with that industrious and precise movement of her arm going on eternally upon all the oceans, under all the skies, in innumerable harbors. And suddenly I heard Fox's voice declare that he could not marry a woman unless she knew of something in his life that had happened ten years ago. It was an accident, an unfortunate accident. It would affect the domestic arrangements of their home, but once told, it need not be alluded to again for the rest of their lives. I should want my wife to feel for me, he said. It has made me unhappy, and how could he keep the knowledge of it to himself, he asked us, perhaps through years and years of companionship. What sort of companionship would that be? He had thought it over. A wife must know. Then why not at once? He counted on Hermann's kindness for presenting the affair in the best possible light. And Hermann's countenance, mystified before, became very sour. He stole an inquisitive glance at me. I shook my head blankly. Some people thought, Falk went on, that such an experience changed a man for the rest of his life. He couldn't say. It was hard, awful, and not to be forgotten, but he did not think himself a worse man than before. Only he talked in his sleep now, he believed. At last I began to think he had accidentally killed someone, perhaps a friend, his own father maybe. When he went on to say that probably we were aware he never touched meat. Throughout he spoke English, of course, of my account. He swayed forward heavily. The girl with her hands raised before her pale eyes was threading her needle. He glanced at her, and his mighty trunk overshadowed the table, bringing nearer to us the breadth of his shoulders, the thickness of his neck, and that incongruous anchorite head, burnt in the desert, hollowed and lean, as if by excesses of vigils and fastings. His beard flowed imposingly downwards, out of sight, between the two brown hands gripping the edge of the table, and his persistent glance, made somber by the wide dilations of the pupils, fascinated. Imagine to yourselves, he said in his ordinary voice, that I have eaten man. 
I could only ejaculate a faint ah of complete enlightenment. Hermann, dazed by the excessive shock, actually murmured, Himmel? For what? It was my terrible misfortune to do so, said Falk in a measured undertone. The girl, unconscious, sewed on. Mrs. Hermann was absent in one of the staterooms, sitting up with Lena, who was feverish. But Hermann suddenly put his hands up with a jerk. The embroidered calot fell. In the twinkling of an eye, he had rumpled his hair all ends up in a most extravagant manner. In this state, he strove to speak. With every effort of his eyes, seemed to start further out of their sockets. His head looked like a mop. He choked, gasped, swallowed, and managed to shriek out one word, beast. From that moment till Falk went out of the cabin, the girl, with her hands folded on the work, lying in her lap, never took her eyes off of him. His own, in the blindness of his heart, darted all over the cabin, only seeking to avoid the sight of Hermann's raving. It was ridiculous and was made almost terrible by the stillness of every other person present. It was contemptible and was made appalling by the man's overmastering horror of this awful sincerity coming to him suddenly with a confession of such a fact. He walked with great strides. He gasped. He wanted to know from Falk how dared he come to tell him this. Did he think himself a proper person to be sitting in this cabin where his wife and children lived? Tell his niece? Expected him to tell his niece? His own brother's daughter? Shameless. Did I ever hear tell of such impudence? He appealed to me. This man here ought to have gone and hidden himself out of sight instead. But it's a great misfortune for me. It's a great misfortune for me, Falk would ejaculate from time to time. However, Hermann kept on running frequently against the corners of the table. At last he lost his slipper and, crossing his arms on his breast, walked up with one stocking foot very close to Falk in order to ask him whether he did think there was anything on earth a woman abandoned enough to mate with such a monster. Did he? Did he? Did he? I tried to restrain him. He tore himself out of my hands, and he found his slipper, and endeavoring to put it on, Storm standing on one leg, and Falk, with a face unmoved and averted eyes, grasped all his mighty beard in one vast palm. Was it right then for me to die myself? he asked thoughtfully. I laid my hand on his shoulder. Go away, I whispered imperiously. Without any clear reason for this advice, except that I wished to put an end to Hermann's odious noise. Go away. He looked searchingly for a moment at Hermann's face. He made a move. I left the cabin, too, to see him out of the ship. But he hung about the quarter deck. It is my misfortune, he said in a steady voice. He was stupid to blurt it out in such a manner. After all, we don't hear such confidences every day. What does the man mean? He mused in deep undertones. Somebody had to die, but why me? He remained still for a time in the dark, silent, almost invisible. All at once he pinned my elbows to my sides. I felt utterly powerless in his grip and his voice, whispering in my ear, vibrated. It's worse than hunger, Captain. Do you know what that means? And I couldn't kill then, or be killed. I wish the crowbar had smashed my skull ten years ago, and I've got to live now, without her. Do you understand? Perhaps many years, but how? What can be done? If I had allowed myself to look at her once, I would have carried her off before that man in my hands, like this. I felt myself snatched off the deck, then suddenly dropped, and I staggered backwards, feeling bewildered and bruised. What a man! All was still. He was gone. I heard Hermann's voice declaiming in the cabin, and I went in. I could not at first make out a single word Mrs. Hermann, who, attracted by the noise, had come in some time before with an expression of surprise and mild disapproval depicted broadly on her face, was giving now all the signs of profound, helpless agitation. 
her husband shot a string of guttural words at her, and instantly putting out one hand to the bulkhead as if to save herself from falling, she clutched the loose bosom of her dress with the other. He harangued the two women extraordinarily, with much of his shirt hanging out of his waist belt, stamping his foot, turning from one to the other, sometimes throwing both his arms together, straight up above his rumpled hair and keeping them in that position while he uttered a passage of loud denunciation, at others folding them tight across his breast and then hissed with indignation, elevating his shoulders and protruding his head. The girl was crying. She had not changed her attitude. From her steady eyes that, following Falk and his retreat, had remained fixed, wistfully, on the cabin door, the tears fell rapid, thick, on her hands, on the work in her lap, warm and gentle like a shower in spring. She wept without grimacing, without noise, very touching, very quiet, with something more of pity than of pain in her face, as one weeps in compassion rather than in grief. And Hermann, before her, declaimed, I caught several times the word mensch, man, and also fressen, which last I looked up afterwards in my dictionary, it means devour. Hermann seemed to be requesting an answer of some sort from her. His whole body swayed. She remained mute and perfectly still. At last his agitation gained her. She put the palms of her hands together, her full lips parted, no sound came. His voice scolded shrilly, his arms went like a windmill. Suddenly he shook a thick fist at her. She burst out in loud sobs. He seemed stupefied, 